Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so pleased to partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History for this evening's program. Today, we are celebrating World Health Day by speaking with Dr. Sandro Valia, who is the author of The Contagion Next Time. As we all know, COVID-19 pandemic, it devastated the world. Within three months in particular, the US was, we were, we were, we were ravaged by it and it infected millions and killed hundreds of thousands. In Dr. Galea's book, he examines America before the pandemic, examining deep-rooted obstacles of racism, marginalization, socioeconomic inequality, especially in regard to health. These forces left many in society vulnerable. As we reflect and move forward, Galea discusses how we can strengthen our systems to prevent the next outbreak from becoming a pandemic and make our nation truly vibrant and equitable. His book points to the fact that our health is a public good and it is worth protecting. Well, before we begin, we always like to thank our numerous library partners nationwide, 1800 strong for joining us and PBS stations across the nation. This is truly important content and we're glad you are here to share it. So, the moment you've been waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sandro Galea. He is a physician and author. He is a Dean of the Robert A. Knox Robert A. Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. He has been named an epidemiologist innovator by Time, a top voice in healthcare by LinkedIn, and is one of the most cited social scientists in the world. His writing and work are featured regularly in national and global public media. A native of Malta, he has served as a field physician for Doctors Without Borders, and he held academic positions at Columbia University, University of Michigan, and the New York Academy of Medicine. Welcome, Sandro. Thank you for having me, it's great to be here. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. To guide today's conversation, we are thrilled to have a fabulous moderator, Dr. Valerie Mahomes. She is the Chief of the Pediatric Trauma and Critical Illness Branch at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. Prior to her position, she was a faculty member at the Yale School of Medicine in the Child Study Center, where she served in numerous capacities, including the Director of Research and Policy for the School Development Program. In this role, she provided an array of educational, clinical, technical support services. Dr. Mahomes is an author of numerous publications, including commentaries, scientific and review articles, book chapters, and monographs. Welcome, Dr. Mahomes. Thank you. So great to have you, Valerie. And before we begin, I'm hoping that you could share a little bit about what you do in your job. Yes, well, I am delighted to be the chief of the Pediatric Trauma and Critical Illness Branch uh, at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. We're about to celebrate our 60th anniversary. Uh, some may not know that the Institute was founded under uh, the administration of President John F. Kennedy, uh, and it's named for his sister Eunice Kennedy Shriver. Um, so I am delighted to have the opportunity to uh, lead our branch in research that focuses on child health and well being um, as, as it relates to trauma, uh, injury, and critical illness across the continuum of care. So, we look at factors that give rise to illness and injury in the family, the community, society, how kids are treated uh, and, and managed with their care in pre hospital intensive care units and in getting them back to society uh, to achieve their developmental milestones. So it's a pleasure to do this work 
and to have the opportunity to advance the science in this area. Well, I feel so lucky that we actually have you to moderate the conversation, especially with your tremendous background and also that you were able to take out a little bit of time for this conversation because I know you must be very busy. So without further ado, I will hand over the conversations, uh, the reins of the conversation to you and just um, looking forward to hearing about the important work, the important book and thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Galea, it's such a pleasure to meet you. This is um, a real delight um, and a treat for me. I love uh, hearing about your, your work and your career. And before we get started in delving into your book, The Contagion, next time, I just have a few curiosities mm -hmm. uh, that I uh, want to explore. Tell us a little bit about your time in Somalia mm -hmm. Um, with the Doctors Without Borders. And as I understand it, that you had a defining moment uh, during that time, which caused you to have a, a, a different thought about your career and what you mm -hmm. wanted to do. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, first of all, Dr. Holmes, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being part of this conversation. So, yeah, you know, I'm trained as uh, originally as a primary care and emergency physician. I was trained at the University of Toronto in Canada. I immigrated to Canada to go to college. And... Uh, the I, I really did training in these fairly remote parts of uh, of Canada, in no, northern Canada, which was training that was really good training to be in uh, remote parts of the world. And after I finished my training and did some work in northern Canada, I also went to work with Doctors at the Borders, as you said, and I was stationed in Somalia. So this is now in the mid to late 90s, a few years after Black Hawk Down, for those who have seen that movie, and uh, about three years, four years after the government of Siad Barre had fallen. And Somalia was, at the time, riven by a number of factions, a number of, sort of warring factions. And I was there as uh, in uh, Muruk region. It was a region in uh, Puntland, northeast Somalia, which is where, for anybody who's seen the other movie, it's, uh, uh, Captain Phillips um, was uh, shot off, uh, off there. And it was about events that happened around there. And I was the only doctor for about 350,000 people. And it was a a really formative period for me. I was working with uh, local health providers and really trying to bring, uh, trying to help and treat people and working in the hospital, doing very classic clinical medicine that I was trained for. And I think I was well trained for by the system. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I felt like I was doing good. You know, I was seeing people who were coming in who were injured or had an illness and within the limits of what was available to us. I think we're helping people return to health. And it was very satisfying as a physician to be doing that. But with that satisfaction, with all that entailed, I couldn't help but feel a sense of frustration, a sense of shortcoming in terms of what I was doing. Because I was in Somalia for a limited period of time. It was very clear. I was there. The whole engagement, including a lot of prep, was almost about a year. But in Somalia, maybe six months, maybe a little bit longer. And I knew I was going to be leaving. And it really became very clear to me that once I left, nothing was going to change. That once I left, everything was going to be roughly the same as it was before I, before I found it. And even though I had helped people in the interim, and I started asking myself, well, there must be a better way because I really, what has motivated me throughout my whole life, really ever since I was a kid, I can remember, is to try to help make people healthy. And th I, I thought to myself, well, this doesn't seem like it's achieving that goal because I'm helping people in the short term, but I'm not doing anything in the long term. So I decided that I needed to learn how one can make people healthy in the long term. And I had heard of public health. I didn't have any training in it. And I decided to go back to school to learn about public health. And that's actually when I immigrated to the US, and that was about 20 years ago, to go back to school and to graduate school in public health. And then my career ever since has unfolded in academic public health. So ironically enough, perhaps, it was a very intense clinical medical experience in Somalia that was the impetus for me to shift and start thinking about the health of populations and to start thinking about how is it that we can do things that make as many people as possible as healthy as possible. And that's really what I think is the job of public health. And it sounds to me from listening to your book, by the way, I listened to it, uh, the audiobook version, which was riveting. And it sounds to me like this book, The Contagion Next Time, certainly is giving a lot of uh, platform for um, uh, people to answer that question. How can we make things better? What are the, the uh, factors that are um, helpful, the infrastructure that's helpful to make things better? Well, the, the book was motivated by 
So, so the book came out in uh, November of uh, 2021, which means I wrote it in the second six months of 2020. So really the pandemic was early in its, in its course. But what it was motivated by was this observation that, you know, at the time we started talking about, about vaccines, it was now fall of 2020, vaccines were about to come out. And there was a lot of conversation about vaccines, about surveillance system. And, and there was an undertone to these public conversations that said, if we can just get the vaccines right, we're gonna fix this. If we can just get treatment right, we're going to fix this. And what I wanted to do was to say, that is all true, vaccines are incredible. And understanding testing and tracing and diagnosis, all of that is fantastically important. But if that's all we do, we're missing the point. Because if all we do is develop a vaccine, we are still not going to deal with some of the underlying forces that made COVID-19 the tragedy it was in this country. You know, about a million people now, we're getting close to a million people have died from COVID-19. And while a lot of that is because we did not have the vaccine, even more of it is because of how our society was structured. It's because of our social forces and economic forces that patterned how we were exposed to the virus and that patterned whether or not we received, we were tested, treated, and uh, for the virus. And those forces are equally as important for us to tend to if we actually want to do better with the next contagion, with the next pandemic. And, you know, I don't think there's any argument that there will be another pandemic. Like, you know, yeah, before yeah. this pandemic... It, it was it was well accepted in my world, the world of epidemiology, the world of public health, the world of medicine, that there would be a pandemic sooner or later. And I think at the moment, it's well accepted there will be another one. So I suppose what's motivating me is to say, I want to inject in the conversation these ideas that I feel are critical, critical for us to wrap our brain around to make sure the next pandemic is not as bad as this one. And I worry that those ideas are being lost in the shuffle as we focus on vaccines and treatment. You know, I was thinking about the title of your book and, um, you know, one of the things that um, occurred to me is that you talk about a lot in your book um, about the pursuit of health. And I thought that uh, your book could very well have been titled um, In the Pursuit of Health. And I have to say, just as an aside, you know, I was invited to, to moderate this session by the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. And your, your book title harkens me back to an old Negro spiritual, which warned of the consequences of, you know, kind of not paying attention to the handwriting on the wall or foreshadowing of things to come. And it ends in this refrain, it won't be water, but fire next time. And it, your, your book title just kind of made me think about if we don't pay attention to uh, all these underlying factors um, that this con the contagion next time uh, might be even more um, uh, deleterious uh, than it than it is now, and I just wonder about your 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 thoughts on that. What do we need to do to pay attention to the handwriting on the wall? I think your book kind of um, you know points us in that direction, uh, but how do we lead the people to? Uh, you know, to the writing and to pay attention to the handwriting on the wall. Well, let's, let's talk about the title first for a second, and uh, thank you for uh, bringing it up. So the title in the book, and I acknowledge this, as you know, is a direct homage to James Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time. And of course, James Baldwin's Fire Next Time comes from these spirituals that you're referring to. And it's a, the book is a searing indictment of racism in America. And the book is not only about racism. Racism is one of the forces that ultimately shapes the world, the, the world around us. Now, so accepting then that there are these forces in the world around us. I think your question is, how do we pay attention to these forces? How do we do something so that these forces are, are tended to and we don't forget them? And I suppose the longer I am in this line of work, the more I think that it is all about what we talk about when we talk about health. And our health conversation is often conflated with healthcare. Our health conversation is often a healthcare conversation, one which means it's about my doctor, my nurse, and your doctor, your nurse, where we make the mistake of thinking that it is our healthcare provider that generates health. Our healthcare provider doesn't generate health. Our healthcare provider, the doctor, restores us to health if we're already sick. But what really creates health is the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food that we eat, whether or not we live in a safe neighborhood where we, we, we run the risk of becoming victims of unanticipated violence, whether or not we actually have a job that puts us at risk, whether there are occupational hazards, whether we have a house that is stable and that generates health. That's what generates health. And at core, 
we need a conversation that recognizes that. We need to make sure that every dinner table, the proverbial and literal dinner table conversation that is about health says, when I say to my family member, well, what generates health? My family member needs to say, well, the fact that I have a roof over my head and I have safe food to eat, that's what generates health. Because once we have those conversations, then we realize that if we want to protect health, be it under non-pandemic times or in pandemic times, we need to pay attention to those forces. And that's what the book tries to do. Well, I think I think it's brilliant, and I did not know about the uh, uh, the connection to James uh, to James Baldwin. So, you know, along that line, um, um, one of the concepts that I found very fascinating is um, the way that you talk about um, health. And you know, one statement that you made um, is that um, um, the political process undermines health. Um, and um, just your, your definition, as you described it, um, is just so illuminating. Um, <clears throat> how do we have that course correction in our thinking to focus differently on the meaning of health? And, and where does this, where does this uh, confluence of uh, these ideas about the political process and just basic kitchen table you know, conversations about health, how do they come together um, to help us to um, really understand what our health really means and how central it is to your ideas about addressing the contagion next time. Let's, let's start with politics for a second because I appreciate the politics question very much. We have done surveys and others have done surveys which ask people, which from these forces do you think matters most for your health? And interestingly, people always say healthcare, medicine, doctors is what matters most for their health. And people tend to say politics is the thing that matters least for their health after things like your smoking, your drinking, your genes, where you live. I, I would I would invert that. I think politics matters most for our health. Now, why do I say that? I say that because politics is what determines where we live, how we live, the resources we're available to. I use one example in the book. Let me just elaborate on that. The example for, of redlining. So redlining emerged from the from the effort in the early part of the 20th century to encourage Americans to own homes. So the Homeowners Loan Corporation was established, and that effort really was a federal effort to go to banks and say, let us encourage you to lend money to people. But to do that, they would take maps. They would take maps, and they would mark them up in green, yellow, or red. Green being areas where, where banks were encouraged to lend money. Now, of course, you can imagine what happened. The green areas were areas where white Americans were living. The red areas were areas where African Americans were living. And hence the term redlining. Now, what did that do? In the 1930s, what it did is, in the 1920s, 1930s, it meant that African-American families were much less likely to own homes than were white families. Now, this is 100 years ago. So you take less home ownership 100 years ago, and you extend it 100 years. What happens is less wealth accumulation by African-American families than white families. Today, African-American families have about 10 times less wealth than do white families. Now you say, what does this have to do with health? Well, wealth buys you a home in a better neighborhood, places where you can exercise, homes which are less crowded. Now, a pandemic hits. And the pandemic is a pandemic where if you're around crowded areas or if you have a job where you have to be there in person, you're more likely to get the virus. Well, that is what Black families experience more than white families in the time of pandemic. Living in houses with more people per capita and having jobs that required attendance in person. And all of that is traceable to efforts like redlining 100 years ago. And as a result, Black Americans were twice as likely than white Americans to develop COVID. So I, th I think that is a simple through line argument that explains why it is that injustice, marginalization, discrimination, and the forces that follow from it pattern our differential risk of the virus. You know, you may remember when the pandemic first hit in early in March of, 20, uh, of uh, 2020, there, were, there was talk about the, the virus does not discriminate because we're all at risk. Well, it's true we're all at risk, but the virus does discriminate. Now, the virus, of course, is virus. It doesn't discriminate itself, but it discriminates because the virus affected people differently depending on our underlying social and economic circumstance, and that patterned the consequence of the virus. So I find that a very compelling argument for saying, unless we deal for example here, with the consequences of redlining from 100 years ago, another virus will happen and the same differential consequences are going to happen. 
compelling indeed. Uh, I'm Valerie Mahomes, and you are watching PBS Books. I'm here with Dr. Sandro Galea, and we are discussing his latest book, The Contagion, next time. Now back to our conversation. Dr. Galea, these ideas uh, that you have been putting forward are so compelling. So I wanna shift now and talk a little bit about children and resilience. And I love how you talk about the development of children and chronicle um, critical milestones in the context of the times that we live in. And you talk about trauma and adverse childhood experiences and the long-term consequences of these experiences. And from my view, the health and well-being of children is a canary in the mind for the health and well-being of all of us. Tell us how the current pandemic has affected children and children of color in particular, and what can we do to ensure um, their well-being? Yeah, I don't think that we fully know the extent to which the pandemic has affected children. I think we're just beginning to learn that. And there are many ways in which the pandemic has affected children. I'll start with the virus itself. And I've written about this, that the virus itself is a trauma. The virus itself has been a traumatic event. Yeah. When you think of a traumatic event as an event that threatens your health and that threatens your sense of stability in your universe, which is broadly speaking a definition of a traumatic event, I think the virus has been that. So I think there is the direct impact of the virus itself. But now there has been an enormous impact of school and education. School and education shapes everything about children's lives. I have my kids, their, their whole life is defined by their school and education. So we, afraid of the virus, curtailed children's education for certainly through 2020, 2021, a little bit lesser extent, 2021, 2022. And we know from the data that are emerging that children of all stripes have fallen behind in math, in language. But of course, it's not even falling behind. Children who live in under-resourced neighborhoods have fallen around more. Because when you're living in under-resourced neighborhoods, you have less access to, the, for example, the digital technologies that can help you access school remotely. You have less access to adults around you who can help supplement your education. And children in under-resourced neighborhoods in this country are disproportionately minority children. So we have taken minority children who already were behind their majority group counterparts and widened the gap in education. Now, the widening gap in education is going to result in a widening in economic and social achievement, which we know over the course of a lifetime results in a, wide, a wider gap in life expectancy and in health. So we have to recognize that the actions we have taken during the pandemic have resulted in a widening of the opportunity gap between certainly children who are from resource have areas versus resource have not areas. Now, you also asked me, I think, uh, very productively, okay, well, what can we do about it? Well, in part, in no small part, what we should do about it is have this conversation. In yes. no small part, what we should do about it is actually surface this issue. So think about how is it that we can invest at the national, at the state, at the local level in making sure that those who are in most need of help get the most help. So if you are to ask me if I had the, pol the policy levers, I would make sure that over the next decade, we really invest in under-resourced neighborhood schools because those are the schools where the children have got, have were already behind and have fallen disproportionately behind in the time of pandemic. You know, and it's so important. I spend a good chunk of my career working in under-resourced uh, schools and um, I am, um, really compelled by the importance of what those schools bring to bear for children. Um, and they are really a signal to us about how we care about children. When children see schools, you know, under-resourced, dilapidated, um, not enough staffing, that's a message in terms of our care uh, for uh, children who are our next, uh, the next generation. Uh, of uh, scientists and scholars, uh, you know, for us. So promoting child development and promoting optimal development for children is essential. And um, having these conversations, are is your book available? Um, how do you uh, see having schools and teachers have conversations around this topic in uh, staff development and in teacher conferences and among principals and um, um, superintendents and people who have the responsibility of making political small p decisions mm -hmm. about children, how they're educated, where they're educated, resources that get invested. 
of how do we get these conversations in, yeah. uh, in, in those hands? Yeah, I really appreciate the question because to my mind, if there is one thing that we can do and that we can, and, and that would make an enormous difference in the long term, it is investing in early childhood and in early child education. And the reason, of course, is very simple, is that if you think of people as having different paths, right? You can have a path where your education is giving you the scaffolding to build a social and economic infrastructure on which you can soar, or you can think of it as not. And once those two paths diverge over time, they result in much wider gaps. So what we should be doing as a society is making sure that children are on the right path as much as possible. And of course, those who look after children are just the teachers, the, super, the, the principals, the superintendents. And it's one of the things that's on my bucket list, I suppose, Good. is to write a book for high schoolers about these ideas. Because I feel like, you know, if you think about it, if you think about what we teach about health in school, you know, we teach some behavioral stuff, right? We say you shouldn't drink too much alcohol, you shouldn't do drugs, you should make sure that you have safe sex. But we don't teach these ideas in high school. To my mind, we should be teaching these ideas in high school because they should become lingua franca so that in our society, it is widely accepted that housing is a health intervention. Yeah. That safe neighborhoods is a health intervention. That being around parks and having having uh, drinkable water, safe food, these are all health interventions. Once we think of them that way, I think we'll make an effort. We'll make an effort to actually address them at the local and at the federal level. You know, I would love to see a presidential primary debate where the candidates argue about how their housing plan is going to improve health. I would love to see that. And we've never seen that. Like we've never seen at that level a conversation about the forces that generate health, but that's where we should get to. Absolutely, absolutely. And young people are very keen on this. When you talk to young people, they are very aware of what they need and um, what these factors are that might be affecting their well-being. Um, and communities that kind of engage citizen scientists and youth uh, to have their voices heard um, really can be elevated um, uh, by that because young people know and have some ideas about how to foster their own uh, their own well-being. They they know what is working with the adults around them and they know what's not working. Well, and oftentimes we try to shield children. I agree completely. And, and not just that, I, I think there is enormous optimism in thinking about young people. I, I uh, you know, it's my privilege to serve as a dean of a school, as, as you heard in my introduction from Heather Marie. And I, I'm constantly surrounded by people who are earlier in their life stage than I am. And I am constantly reminded about how good they are, about how, how much they recognize the importance of the world around them and how committed they are to creating a better world. I mean, you look at Gen Z, the kids who are in high school right now, there is a very natural commitment to doing right by the world, to writing long-seated injustices. And I do feel like at the COVID moment has perhaps been a catalyst. It's perhaps been a catalyst for young people everywhere who are committed to these ideals. And I think if that's the case, that's a wonderful thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, I'm often asked, well, how do we... I mean, how, how do you not lose something? It's by by talking about it, by writing about it, by keeping it present, and by getting young people, as you said, engaged in these conversations. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wanna talk a little bit about the future. You're in a position um, to support the next generation of researchers and epidemiologists and people who might have the same kind of defining experience as, as you have had. And uh, you know, we do the same thing by providing funding for training and career development. Um, how do we train the next generation of scientists? Where do you see a gap, especially in addressing this leaky pipeline? How do we get more youth of color uh, moving into these fields and being interested in public health um, and getting them the resources, the mentoring and the support that we need to train the next generation of scientists to address some of these, uh, some of these questions? And science policy um, uh, foci. Um, well, I, I feel like by asking the question, now I'm feeling like I need to get off the call and go start writing that book because I'm feeling, I'm feeling the pressure now. Um, the, um, the point about the leaky pipeline is, uh, from Holmes is, a, is, a, is a very good one. And, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about things like that because I'm dean of a school, as I know to you, as you support uh, students. And I feel like the way to fix the leaky pipeline, of course, is to fix 
the leaks at every point along the way, right? It's a, it's a, it's not like a we have a leaky pipeline because of one spot, right? It's it's like right. all right from the beginning, all the way through people's success professionally. And I think we need to create an environment which is as maximally supportive as possible for all children and young adults and adults of irrespective of their stripe of any identity dimension to support those who are committed to doing the work of health, who are committed to doing the science and the practice of health. And I think to do that requires the hard work to identify the areas where it's harder to become a scholar or a practitioner of health. This goes back a little bit to what I was saying earlier about the kids who fell behind and being conscious of that and to create the educational opportunities and pipelines for those kids to go on and take these steps. Now, I, I see a lot of positive uh, positives in this. By way of one example, um, in 2019, it was the first year nationally where the majority of kids, uh, I apologize, but of young people, <laughs> that's I betrays my age, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, should, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Please, I take that back. Um, uh, the majority of, of uh, people who were admitted into graduate programs of public health were non-majority group. For, for the first time, um, uh, white people were a minority among people admitted, which the majority was made up of, of Hispanic, um, uh, Black Americans, Asian Americans. And that's really a dramatic shift, right, over the past 20 years, where public health used to be very much a majority group sort of but vast majority, and it's really shifted. And, and we see that in our students. We see it in our students. And these are students who say, well, I've seen my community being disproportionately affected by the pandemic, and that motivated me to want to do public health. So these are, these are good. These are good shifts because we want people of all identities to engage in the business of promoting health. Because you know what? What's more important than promoting health? And what the pandemic has shown us is that we care about health. You care about health. I care about health. I actually don't know anybody who doesn't care about health. That's actually what's amazing about it. You know, one of the things with the book book, book launch, I did a whole bunch of right wing radio, which you know has a bit of a, a bit of reputation, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a particular form of media entertainment. But I didn't talk to a single host on right wing radio who doesn't want to be healthy. Everybody right. to, and everybody wants their kids to be healthy. So That's I right. think I think health is a unifying force, and it is a force that we want to make sure that everybody in our society of all identities participates in because we collectively will be better off for it. That is so compelling. And, and we have a few minutes left. Um, and one of the things that I want to hear you uh, reflect on is a, a phrase that you use in, in your book. Um, you talk about the distance between better and best. Um, so how do we get to best uh, as we leave our audience today? What's a key takeaway that you would want your audience to hear about getting closing that distance between better and best? Yeah, the um, I talk in the book about how the fact that we as a country spend more on health than any other country in the world, but we have we live sicker and shorter lives than all other high income countries. So we have excellent spending in our healthcare systems. And we do very well on that. But overall, we still die younger and are sicker. And that is because we do not invest in these other forces that generate health. To be the best at health, we need to invest in these other forces. And sometimes I'm pressed into, when I have conversations, people say, well, are you saying we should invest less in our hospitals? That's not what I'm saying at all. I want to have the best possible hospital when I have a heart attack. But I actually want to make sure I don't have a heart attack to begin with as much as possible. And to do that, we need to recognize that our health is produced not just by the hospital looking after a heart attack, but it's by the food we eat, by whether we exercise, whether there's violence in the world around us, whether we live in stable housing, whether or not we have a livable wage that allows us to balance work and uh, personal life, all of which contributes to stress and nutrition and exercise, which then contributes to whether or not we're going to get heart disease. To get to be the best of health, we need to spend more smartly than we are right now. And we spend a lot of money on health. And I would like us as a country to have the best possible health. Right now, we do not. We're nowhere near the best possible health. We, in fact, have the worst health compared to other high-income countries. But we spend enough that we should expect to have the best health. It has been such a thrill to hear your, your ideas um, and your concepts. And 
Um, I'm going to hold you to uh, thinking about writing something for children <laughs> and uh, for high school with children. A because, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that they will surprise you every time and they hit the nail right on the head. If we would just ask them, <laughs> they will tell us how to close, uh, how to close these gaps. Uh, so I just uh, really thank you for your compelling work on this topic. Um, and thank you for sharing your work and for giving me the pleasure and the privilege of being able to have this, this, this conversation with you. Um, so at this time, I'm going to invite back uh, Heather Marie Matia, who will uh, close us out with this program. And uh, it's so exciting. I have so many more questions, Heather. I could talk for another hour. I know. It was such an amazing conversation. I mean, I was thinking as I was sitting here that I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up because I wanted to help people, right? And here I'm sitting here with two doctors. Along the way though, I realized there were other ways to help people. And I actually, my, I have a master's degree in public policy, not public health. But everything you touched on is so incredible because it, it drives home that first of all, I don't think young people really know there is a career in public health and both of you have pointed to that and that's so important. So all you parents out there who are watching share these concepts with your kids about the difference you can make in public health and the conversation about having a, you know, a roof over your head and safe food. And when I think of the Flint water crisis that happened in Michigan, yeah. right? And is still happening in terms of, is that water safe and the effects on the children, right? All of that makes us realize that there are systemic issues that our country needs to deal with and health is, is at the base of it. And so, um, Dr. Galia, I hope you'll re you'll you'll start writing your book and yes. <laughs> and share it with all of us because it's incredible and your message has been truly truly incredible for us to be able to hear and to be able to share with the nation. Um, so thank you for for your work and uh, Dr. Mahomes, your questions were thought provoking. They were amazing and and we're so lucky that we that we got you to to lead this conversation. And you mentioned citizen scientists. And in fact, um, Citizen Science Week is the week of Earth Week. It's, uh, I believe, April 20th. We'll be having an event talking about citizen scientists right. for young people. It'll be at 7 p.m. We're partnering with at Student Reporting Lab, uh, PBS, our Student Reporting Lab, as well as SciStarter. So everyone out there, don't forget to, to, to tune in as well. Well, we have to end the conversation. So thank you all of you out there for joining us. Until next time from PBS Books, happy reading and stay healthy.